Hey, good morning. Hopefully uh, you're beginning your day, you know, with uh, with Jesus, which I know you are because you're here. So we get to do this, you know, together. Still um, blows my mind uh, as I process through that uh, when people used to try to get together to do quiet times or studies with one another, like we still do, like at the church, uh, I don't know, we got a men's groups or ladies groups, you know, on Wednesday, uh, that we can actually do this, you know, via Zoom, via Facebook, via, you know, different mediums through digital ways. And so kind of cool to see uh, that uh, this is something we can do together. Um, so with that, I want to remind you that uh, tonight is Vision Sunday, Vision Weekend. Uh, Sunday is one of them, but tonight online, on site, as we just kind of look forward, you know, to what God is doing. It's almost like an in-house family meeting. So uh, it's not bad for new people to be able to come because they kind of get to see, you know, the inside of what uh, what God's doing and, and maybe God calls them to be a part of that. So with that being said, we are jumping into 2 Samuel chapter 3. Uh, we're looking at the life of David, you know, it's, it's kind of switched from Samuel, you know, as the emphasis to Saul to now, you know, King David, and we can kind of see his life. And, uh, unfortunately, you know, we also get to see the consequences. And, and I think I pointed this out before that, uh, David was not perfect, you know, by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, we've already looked at a couple different things that he did that were not pleasing to the Lord. We already looked at a couple ways in which he did not seek the Lord, uh, in making decisions, you know, and today. Today, uh, we're going to be able to see another example of uh, what David did that was against what God, you know, had asked. Again, God doesn't completely abandon him. You know, he still is a man after God's own heart. But there are consequences, you know, both positive, you know, but also negative behind the choices and the actions in which we even have, you know, in Christ. And so uh, just with that kind of background, let's uh, take a look. Second Samuel chapter 3. Um, the, uh, we just remember we talked yesterday about, you know, this battle, you know, that took place, you know, between David's men and, uh, Saul's son's man, uh, Abner specifically, you know, who killed, uh, Joab's, uh, brother. And, uh, so we pick up after this kind of conflict has happened. That was the beginning of a long war between those who are loyal to Saul and those loyal to David. As time passed, David became stronger and stronger while Saul's dynasty became weaker and and weaker. Then it says this, David's sons born in Hebron. So just give us kind of just a quick timeline of, you know, um, how David had sons. Uh, now notice though, you know, how many different women he had these sons with. The oldest was Amnon, whose mother was Ahinoam from Jezreel. The second was Daniel, whose mother was Abigail, the widow of Nabal from Carmel. The third was Absalom, whose mother was Makkah, uh, the daughter of Tal Talmai, king of Jeshur. The fourth was uh, Adon Adonjah, whose mother was Agath. The fifth was Shep Shepatiah, uh, whose mother was Abata. The sixth was Ithriam, whose mother was El uh, Egla, David's wife. These sons were all born to David in Hebron. So six different sons born by six different, you know, uh, women that uh, David had made his wife. Now, you know, look at this and go, understand, this was not from the Lord. This is not from the Lord. This shows that David went against God's commandments that Israel's king should not multiply wives to himself. You know, he was wrong to have more than one wife because David, God's command, you know, to the kings in Deuteronomy 17, 17, he said this, not to do this. You know, he also, his heart for marriage is one man and one woman, Genesis 2, 24. And obviously we know on the other side, you know, but uh, uh, is Matthew 19, but according for David, it was earlier on. Uh, uh, David's, you know, had many wives, you know, the kings would have many wives in that day for many reasons, you know, especially to express power and uh, status. Uh, and, but understand this, his trouble came later in life because of his many wives. And sometimes people ask, why doesn't the Bible expressly condemn David's polygamy here? But as often as the case, the scripture is just simply states the fact and later, we get records of how David's reaped the penalty for this sort of sin in regards to his family. And so we see, you know, over and over and over, there is so much infighting, destruction. There is incest. There is rape. You know, there is murder that takes place among these kids of David, you know, because of David's choice not to follow the Lord. 
You know, and so we just want to be reminded how important it is, you know, to follow the Lord, that there is consequence, maybe not immediately, but down the line, if we're not following him. And then it says uh, this in verse six, as the war between the house of Saul and the house of David went on, Abner became a powerful leader among those loyal to Saul. You know, so um, uh, again, you know, Abner, you know, is uh, is the over the army, you know, of Saul, even though Ishbosheth you know, is actually the king of the northern that Abner put in, you know, put in place. And so because he's gaining more and more power and more and more notoriety, one day Ishbosheth, Saul's son, accused Abner of sleeping with one of the father's concubines, one of his father's concubines, a woman named Rizpah, daughter of Aya. Now, we don't know whether this is true or not, but we do know that Abner's response lets us know that it probably is not. Because the reason this is important is because Isbashah is accusing Abner in that day of a serious, serious crime. Taking a royal concubine was regarded as both sexual immorality in that day, but also a form of treason. So obviously, Abner's rising. That's why the Bible says strength and power. And here's Ishbosheth. He's like, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be the king. And, a- and Asher just loses it. He just, Ab- Abner just loses it. And he's furious. He goes, am I just some Judean dog to be kicked around like this? He shouted, after all I have done for your father Saul and his family and friends by not handing you over to David, is this my reward that you find fault with me about this woman? May God strike me and even kill me if I don't do everything I can to help David get what the Lord has promised him. I'm going to take Saul's kingdom and give it to David. I will establish the throne of David over Israel as well as Judah, all the way from Dan to the north and Bathsheba to Bathsheba in the south. Ishbosheth didn't dare say another word because he was afraid of what Abner might do. Now it's fascinating. Abner knows that God himself is the one, by his very own words, is the one who promised the kingdom to David. And now he's going to actually do what he can to help David establish that kingdom in which God has promised. And what's fascinating about that is that isn't that the case when it comes to us? You know, uh, so often, you know, we know the right thing to do, but we don't often do it because it may not serve our own interest at the time. So Abner knows that the right thing, he's told, he's aware, even in his own words, he's aware that God is the one who's given him this kingdom and he's fighting against David up until this time, up until this time, you know, when he realizes, you know what, I'm gonna do what God has actually sworn to him to transfer the kingdom and be able to give it to King David. And I just start thinking, I'm like, yeah, you know, to know the right thing versus doing the right thing are two different things, isn't it? To know the right thing versus doing the right thing is two very different things. And Abner knew the right thing, but he waited till now to be able to do the right thing. And so uh, after we see this, you know, we we jump down to verse 12. Then Abner sent messengers to David saying, doesn't the entire land belong to you? Make a solemn pact with me and I will help turn over all of Israel to you. All right, David replied, but I will not negotiate with you unless you bring back my wife, Michael, Saul's son, when you come. And so this is two things. Either it's uh, it's a strategic play, you know, on David's part to try to unite the kingdom of Saul again with the kingdom, you know, that God has given to David. That could be one of the things. The other one is it says that that, uh, Michael was in love with David, you know, and he's trying to honor that first commitment. You know, um, either way we get to see, you know, what happens, you know, with this condition. And, uh, and so it says, David had sent this message to Isbosheth's son, Saul's son, give me back my wife for I bought her with the lives of a hundred Philistines. You can read about that in first Samuel, which we talked about, you know, uh, a few weeks back. So Ishbosheth uh, took Michael away from her husband, Palti, son of Laish. Palti followed along behind her as far as Bahurim, weeping as he went. Then Abner told him, go back home. So Pat, uh, Palti returned, which is just a sad display. This this husband uh, had done nothing, 
nothing but try to love this wife. And now this lady is being removed from her, from him in this relationship. So once again, you know, bad choice for, begets bad choice and people get hurt, you know, along the way. Meanwhile, Abner had consulted with the elders of Israel. For some time now, he told them, you wanted to make David your king. Now is your time. For the Lord has said, I have chosen David to save my people Israel from the hands of the Philistines and from all their other enemies. Once again, Abner knew what was right. He just didn't do it. Abner also spoke with the men of Benjamin and he went to Hebron to tell David that all the people of Israel and the Benjamin had agreed to support him. When Abner and the 20 of his men came to Hebron, David entertained them with a great feast. Then Abner said to David, let me go and call an assembly of all Israel to support my Lord, the king. They will make a covenant with you to make you their king and you will rule over everything your heart desires. So David sent Abner safely on his way. Now it's significant, you know, just for a second before we wrap up today, that this word comes from Abner when he's communicating to the elders of Israel instead of it coming from David himself. David's not the one who reaches out to the elders. He asks Abner and Abner's the one who says, I will be the one to go. And David says, yes, you must go. Though David is the rightful king, he would not reign over Israel until they submitted to him freely. Differently, he never moved an inch without an invitation. This, my friends, is an illustration of Jesus Christ. He is the fact, the King of Kings, and he is the Lord of Lords. But he chooses, for the most part, to exercise his sovereignty only at our invitation. Some do not invite Jesus to rule over anything. Others invite Jesus to reign a small area like David is doing in Hebron, and some give Jesus reign over everything he has authority over, which in fact is everything. And so my question for you as we close today, to know the right thing versus do the right thing are two completely different things. And my hope is that you and I would recognize that there might be aspects or large areas of our lives that still need the reign and rule. And by invitation, you and I would say, Jesus, we invite you into this area. Jesus, once again, I've been trying to lead over my kids, over my finances, over my identity, you know, over my future, over my health, over my purpose, over my mission. And I invite you, Jesus, to take the reins. I invite you, Jesus, to lead this area of my life. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for this day and for the reminder and what we see in the example of David, you know, even now. Father, we see uh, examples of what it means to know the right thing versus do the right thing and the consequences that are gonna come from that in David's life. But we also see the reign and rule of your son, Jesus, that allows us to be a part of that and, and, and that we would just submit areas of our lives and entrust them to you. Father, in the same way that Abner is finally realizing some things for the nation, that we would realize some things in our own lives. We know, Father, there's areas we want you to lead. Allow us to do so on this day. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, just a couple uh, shout outs before we go. You know, Sadie Logue, it is great to see you. You know, hang in there. She's at YWAM in Kona. And so she's doing what God has asked her to do. She has submitted herself to that. And it's not easy, Sadie, is it? You know, but you, if you hang in there, and if you continue to move forward, even in days of loneliness or difficulty or challenge, you know, or stress or isolation, you will find yourself more mature in the faith as you move forward. And also you guys saw that Steve Allen and the team are joining us once again from Egypt. So just continue to pray for them, you know, throughout the rest of this weekend, you know, as they kind of wrap up their trip, you know, in the next uh, several days, uh, ask that the Lord would just lead and guide them. So Steve, it's great to see you. Uh, wish I could be with you, but know that God is leading and guiding and directing your steps as you guys submit and follow him. So I love you guys. Uh, I'll see many of you guys tonight or on, online, or I'll see you on Sunday as well. Have a great day.